needed to record that on the cloud. First, welcome everyone. So glad to have you all for another community call um, at the beginning of 2024. We have uh, some member speakers, non-member speakers today, and we are talking today about the topic of makerspaces and universities, libraries, and institutions in general. Uh, so just a little background on this topic. Uh, we had a call uh, sometime at the end of 2023 on new beginnings, right? And we had some of our members like Nauras who uh, had recently signed an OMOU with the university in Basra in Iraq and uh, was kicking off this project with all its layers. And um, we had an amazing conversation around uh, needs, what it means, what can be done, how can gig members support in something like this. And then afterwards, this conversation came up again as I was attending Volka in Slovenia, Volka 2023. And this is where I met with Leila, who had uh, also given me such an interesting insight um, uh, on her experience establishing a makerspace in a university in Prague, uh, one of our speakers today. I've also uh, met um, with Mike, who is part of the Open Network, Offene Werkstatt in Deutschland, open workshops in Germany that a lot of us are actually familiar with. And at the time, he was also part of a big consortium meeting uh, of makerspaces and universities in Germany that seemed very, very interesting and I was invited to to attend as well. Um, and at the same time, we had the conversation with Yuri, who had uh, uh, just uh, founded UMA, Ukrainian Makerspaces Association, and was also talking about the possibility of establishing makerspaces and universities there and just starting the process and trying to understand more and what's needed. Sad, on the other uh, uh, hand, uh, who's the founder of Edible Makerspace in Singapore, had uh, showed us a project of working with a makerspace in the library in Singapore and doing such great work. So all of this led me to think, how about we bring all these amazing people together and uh, see what comes out of it and how could we be of help to each other around us. So today, this call is going to be basically exactly on that. It's uh, not really structured in the sense of trying to reach a certain output, but really about uh, having an open heart, open head to listen to the experiences of others and see what we can do together. Um, so who of our speakers would like to go ahead, introduce themselves and maybe give some of their insights? Uh, would you mind? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, um, I I wanted to start because I have uh, I think I have uh, more questions that could be maybe could be uh, covered by uh, speakers here. So uh, we started Ukrainian Maker Association to help makerspaces to survive, and we working in JZ pro program now, and we working in collaboration with Geek. So a lot of things going on. My my focus now on. <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, association focus uh, mainly uh, uh, bring makerspaces, uh, general kind of open makerspaces, uh, tools to survive. We <clears throat> we producing uh, researchers. We produced uh, in collaboration with uh, Geek. Uh, we produced uh, I, I, uh, not produce translate and and was a part of research of business model for makerspaces. And there were six Ukrainian makerspaces in that research. And this type of document uh, helping makerspace leaders to understand uh, what tools they should use or could use to uh, uh, to make uh, some funds or to, to raise some funds for living, for developing, for relocation, for uh, tools update and maintenance and for uh, other type of activities. And now we're working on general playbook how to start a makerspace. And uh, uh, in these early stages, we have a lot of requests from uh, different types of makerspaces, from school makerspaces, and uh, particularly from university makerspaces. They they trying to establish a space, but they again they don't know. Uh, they like uh, visit the, they visiting uh, European spaces and. Uh, 
and American maybe spaces. But again, when it goes about establishing here at the at the university, and they have a lot of questions, I, I don't have answered for. So my idea and my question to Fadia was: Is there any people who could uh, 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 you could introduce us to to maybe can make the bridges in nearest, I hope, future? So Fadia, thanks a lot for this meetup today. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm I'm becoming ears. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. It's always an inspiration to be talking to you and to see your journey with all the developments. And this really what I love about this community is is the kind of support sometimes. Uh, is not even like material, but just the support by knowing that there are other people sharing the same questions, struggles, have maybe solutions, answers to some of your questions. So uh, it's not me, it's our lovely community. Um, who would like to go next from our speakers? Um, I can go next. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Leila Yunis. I'm from the Maker Institute in Prague. I have met and worked personally with both Mike and Saad. So Yuri, happy to uh, talk to you. Um, I'll I'll go maybe a little bit onto the answers and then in, introduce myself progressively. So I've been uh, the director of the Maker Institute, which was a nonprofit that started between two universities in Prague and the uh, National Technical Library. Uh, we aimed to open a universal maker space on campus for these three institutions um, more actively. And then there are several other institutions in this campus. Um, I think that the promise was quite high. It is very difficult to start a large maker space uh, amongst three public institutions. And instead, we have aimed at developing either singular maker spaces or mobile maker spaces, or just to work with simple classes. And now within the starting the third year of uh, me leading this uh, institute, um, the status is that we're most likely gonna develop two separate maker spaces inside two different faculties and not aim at this very high end goal. Um, so my answer is start uh, very little um, start by offering Yudi maybe or showing people how a makerspace can be at a very small scale, um, bringing some 3D printed classes if people like it, bringing some soldering kits if people like it, and then progressively introduce the idea of a makerspace um, via that. Um, you. Public and private universities are a completely different uh, side of the spectrum. Um, uh, we will we can talk about public uh, libraries and uh, universities. And Mike and I have, you know, he'll be, yeah, grabbing the head. This is, you know, the the gesture. So the best thing is to develop something with the private and use that as a showroom for the public, I guess, uh, would be my my solution. Um, it's just simpler, it's easier, it's uh, motivating and 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 start little. Um, lastly, I would say that even though I've had the same conversation with the same people for over two years, somehow they want to reshuffle and use different uh, wording uh, in order to to get involved in the maker spaces and just keep on aiming at the ambassador people that you find uh, in, in each space. So if one person wants it, just aim at that person and uh, keep keep going at it. So hopefully by uh, within three months, we have established two small maker spaces inside of classrooms instead of a larger maker space. And that's, yeah, I guess start little and don't um, don't think too big too soon and then progressively scale. Amazing, what a start. Small steps and um, big dreams. So Sad and Mike, who would like to go next?
Mike, if you're ready. I try to. Can you hear me? Yes. Because we have a noisy makerspace here and the technology doesn't work so well. So um, I should, can you manually switch to the, uh, to the bigger picture or wait, let's try something else. No, it doesn't work. Um, I'm here at the makerspace uh, in a university library, which is independent from, uh, from the university itself. So this is a very specific thing, and um, it's um, helpful to have a new a neutral Switzerland <laughs> within the university, <laughs> um, since uh, you always, uh, if you if you have a, this stuff as a professorship running, then you always uh, have the problem that you have these little kingdoms, and um, this is what my suggestion at this point is: uh, if you run in the university, find a place where uh, everybody can agree on and. Uh, not uh, a single thing is, is running, it might be helpful. I'm just back from a, a visit in France and uh, they liked it very much to have the, the, the fact that we fighting with the same bureaucracy as they have. <laughs> so safety regulations, uh, other stuff, if you buy something or if you, have, uh, if you just want to open a window, it's might sometimes a nightmare. Um, so keep in mind that this is a big struggle sometimes. I don't know how it will be in the Ukraine, but um, Leila, <laughs> we can spend, <laughs> there's not, much, not enough alcohol in the world to, <laughs> to, to fight with that issue. <laughs> um, and the other thing is uh, what I would say, so here we have a space, um, maybe you can see in the small picture, I can move the camera a bit around. So we have 200 square meters, which is all in one. And right now they're running two classes and it's quite of uh, too mixed. So you need, uh, if you are able, try to find a place which is open. If everybody can see what's happening around, but still uh, from the noise level, somehow separated that you can uh, choose the right, uh, that you need that everybody see what's happening around them is very important, I think. Otherwise, if, if everybody is, fixed to his own desk <laughs> or a little office, then there will be no community, no, no exchange between them. But still you need the, 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 the silence of each space. And um, here we have a lot of equipment, but not so much users. So I uh, just can follow Leila's uh, um, recommendation, start slow, ask the people what the tools they need. I've seen so many places, they bought a laser cutter, they bought 3D printers, but they, then they bought the, then the users came, ah, we need a different 3D printer, or we need a, another laser cutter because this is more fun, this it could be two centimeters more. So uh, try to find uh, some key users at the beginning and uh, we fetch, we figure out what problems, what, what projects they want to do and start with that, with very specific things. So right now we have, for example, I can show you it. I think one guy here, <laughs> uh, they should have a medical, medical issue, something for education. We also had another medicine professor here last week to produce something. And if you have something like that, so really not not start in, a, in an empty bubble, let's say it in that way. So try to find the first key users with very specific things, ask what they need, and then go, go with that. And then grow step by step. That's what I would recommend at this point. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, this space, uh, yeah, I need to, and never under expect the, the fight with the technology. It's never worked in the way you want it. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. What a nice a tour around the space as well. And maybe just <laughs> afterwards, it would be great, uh, uh, maybe in a bit, if you can also tell us how your journey started with all of this and how you're involved in the network of many makerspaces in Germany. But for now, yeah. we're, yeah, okay. But for now, we'll head over to Saad. Saad, please, you have the floor. Thanks, Fadia. Um, with, um... The makerspace that I'm been uh, involved with, it's uh, kind of unique in Singapore. Um, it's uh, placed in a public library, 
and it's very new even for Singapore uh, to have um, a makerspace that is catering to persons with disabilities. Um, we've had, uh, there are 12 branches around Singapore uh, of libraries and only four out of these libraries have makerspaces in them. And most people in Singapore don't know uh, that, that these exist. So the libraries aren't exactly very good at doing outreach and getting people in, but um, being public spaces, it affords a very unique opportunity to, um, as both Leila and Mike were saying, uh, respond to the needs of the community. So people feel like, okay, this is a public space. And now there's maker type activity going on in this public space that we are kind of comfortable, or at least it sets the context. Um, so it, it kind of takes away this, um, uh, the scary aspect of all these machines. Um, so you start seeing 3D printing or laser cutting in a more, uh, like a public facility kind of way because it's in a in, in a public library um but within the context of singapore it's still a little bit alien to a lot of people people still feel shy feel scared they're not really sure how to you know approach the devices how to approach the space um not as much experience with you know what a maker space is like and what the rules are and things like that so people definitely need some kind of onboarding process or some kind of um uh, uh, a bridge um to get started with co-creating instead of like the default established norm is we go into the space and then you expect somebody to sort of give you an instruction and then you attend this it becomes very formalized um but because it's a public space i feel like we don't really need to follow those uh rules um, there's there's room for trying something new. So what I've been trying to do um, with a bunch of volunteers and similarly like-minded people is exactly that. We've been trying to start small um, and respond to basically start the conversation and say, look, these are the devices, that's what they can do. But the stuff that they make is really just a tool for us to get to know what the needs are. And when we talk to people with uh, disabilities, we talk to caregivers of persons with disabilities, um, the needs are expressed in a very strange manner. Uh, most people are like, yeah, I found this thing on the internet. It was extremely expensive. So I gave up on trying it out. Um, but that starts the conversation. And then, you know, you have somebody in the room that says, look, you can 3D print it. So it's not going to be that expensive anymore. Are you now interested again? So then you get to know their needs and, and stuff like that. So that's the kind of process we've been following. Uh, but it's very much like a, a, a community space. Um, and uh, it, there's only one small little space now that we've carved out for ourselves. Uh, so it's, it's a constant struggle. Singapore is a tiny little country, city, island. Um, so it's, it's, uh, space is always uh, a concern and, you know, the, the, the fact that we're able to do this, uh, is, is quite unique, but yeah, going back to what, you know, both Dela and Mike said, you know, start small, uh, and so don't worry too much about the scaling of things. Uh, the, the community will help inform what direction you should take and just follow your gut in my situation. Thank you so much, Sad. It's also, it was a very inspiring project that you've showed working with people with disabilities in public uh, library was really nice. So if you can share maybe a link or some resources to this, that would be really nice. I yeah, I mean, wanna... I've, I've, sorry, I don't know how we are placed for time, but I've got like a whole bunch of photos uh, that I've set aside that I wanted to sort of just quickly show. Please go ahead, yes. So, uh, I'm not able to share. Thank you. So Singapore, a uh, really, really tiny little place. Um, it's really not fair to call Singapore a country because uh, we're really a city island. Um, but uh, we are located in this tiny little corner of tiny little Singapore uh, and the library itself is uh, kind of cool. 
It's designed for uh, persons with disabilities and, you know, uh, visible and invisible disabilities. Um, so it's mm -hmm. uh, quite cool. They've got a lot of assistive technology spread around uh, the the library itself. Um, the building is uh, just six, seven months um, in operation now, eight months now. Um, so it, people are still getting used to it. But it's really nice to have the context of these uh, commercial, uh, commercially available uh, ass assistive tools. And it's still quite new to a lot of people. Um, a lot of people don't know that this kind of technology exists. Uh, but the library has this as part of, uh, you know, the lending of books and borrowing of books and things like that. So um, it's quite nice to have a space that is uh, wheelchair accessible, but also the staff there are um, uh, trained in how to introduce people to different ways of using uh, the facilities. So that's quite nice. It creates a, an environment where people feel a little bit more uh, welcome and included. Um, so just to give you a sense of the space, um, like what Mike did, I really appreciate that. Whenever we talk to people from different countries, it's really hard to get a sense of what their spaces look and feel like. Uh, but this is our little corner. Uh, you can see up, up against the wall in the back, uh, you have a whole bunch of um, uh, little cubby holes where you've got 3D printers. Um, and uh, these uh, machines are available for the public to borrow um, just like they would rent uh, a little desk. So okay. there's no supervision. It's all very self-help uh, and it's free of cost, which um, again, I guess only works for Singapore's context. Um, but yeah, we do uh, our little uh, co-creation design thinking sessions uh, every Sunday and uh, volunteers show up and we decide on what needs to be uh, worked on based on who shows up and what they're interested in. So there's no set fixed agenda. It's all very uh, free and open uh, uh, to the participation. So the projects that we work on um, all have something to do with persons with disabilities or uh, the caregivers. Um, mm. They, okay, I'm just gonna very quickly skip ahead to the, other stuff that we have. So we sometimes do uh, little like uh, workshop type sessions uh, where you get people who are interested in uh, our process to uh, join in. Uh, this was the critical making workshop that we did um, to get people to sort of inform what our onboarding process should be like. Um, and once we had that uh, from the room, then that's what we've been following ever since. So we lay out um, basically a set of starting questions, see what uh, the, the room is interested in, and then start working on that. Um, all of the people who come are volunteers. I Can wanted to highlight. Can you do the copy machine for the No. That's the kitchen door. Mike is working on a coffee machine. Oh. Sorry, microphone is on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. See, I wanted to uh, make this uh, a point because um, in Singapore, when you say you're doing this as a volunteer it, at the library, people sometimes think that you're getting paid by some kind of government sponsorship. So we had to make little badges that actually explicitly said we are unpaid volunteers, which I think is a little bit weird. Um, but yeah, highly Singapore. Uh, centric situation. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, the space. We've got a whole bunch of 3D printers. We've got um, laser cutters and uh, we use them um, to create prototypes uh, as a means of understanding uh, the context and working with the caregivers as well as the, the person with disability uh, in a hands-on iterative uh, kind of way. And the only thing we ask is that people who participate are um, open to share and everything that we create is uh, free and open source, uh, which also gives us the advantage of um, reaching out to all the free and open source resources that are available uh, through programs like Carables and Printables and all of the other commons that you find online. So that's in a brief nutshell, that's kind of what we do. That's amazing. So lovely to be seeing what is happening on your side of the world, um, Sad. 
And just before we get deeper into the discussion, I feel like uh, uh, as a group of specialists, sometimes we forget to talk about the reason we do all of this. So when you think of makerspaces and universities or libraries, the first thing that comes into my mind is that universities are places Often we think of makerspaces as spaces for alternative ways of learning. Um, everything that we don't need or can't find in a university, sorry, not, not don't need, but can find in a university sometimes, the very linear way, the very uninteractive way of learning. And then comes this idea of an alternative space where people are creating things and learning things that are not necessarily belonging to their fields uh, of their studies. And, and I just, wanted to get a glimpse from any of our speakers today. Why do you think it's important to have a makerspace in, in a library or in a university? And what what made you approach or uh, if you were approached, what was, what was the motive from the institution in that sense? Um, and I see there is a question there. So maybe we can also take uh, Geraldine's question and then move on to our speakers. Go ahead, please. Awesome. Yeah, I wanted to link uh, point or question with your question and I also want to thank everybody for the presentation it's really nice to get the insights and lovely to see the photos and direct images of the spaces so thank you very much for that and it was so timely as I've um, been sharing in different places we've just been writing this horizon proposal about maker spaces and libraries so it's just particularly nice to see your photos um, start and things happening there in Singapore. So yeah, fingers crossed we'll get this and hopefully be able to create nice connections to your work. Um, the, the topic on my mind was kind of the evolution of the dynamic between fab labs and non-university based makerspaces. And I'm just curious to hear other people's thoughts on this and you have to forgive me because I'm a little bit tired today so it might not be perfectly poignantly phrased, but I feel, I'm, you know, like the fab lab movement of course is what gave all this a lot of traction and they kind of met with this very grassroots CEO we're doing things in open workshops movement that has always kind of been around but in a way less official way and now we've had a sh shift or a phase of time where there's been such a wealth of maker spaces popping up with different focus on different target groups, different sizes, different nature, and a little bit of an emancipation, maybe you could say, of the makerspace of the Fab Lab movement. So um, also because many Global South makerspaces maybe aren't as perfectly equipped or were finding it so easy to become a part of the Fab Lab movement. Again, it'd be interesting to hear if this is true from your point of view or not. And and now we have kind of a situation where both exist in, in equality, you could say. Anyway, this is what how I've been kind of seeing it take shape or dynamics, but I would be so interested to hear any other thoughts or reflections on that. Um, yeah, Fab Lab and versus Makerspace dynamic overall. Thank you. Yes, Leila, I see you unmuted. Great. So um, as I said, we are a little bit struggling within our own spaces to, you know, where we locate ourselves. So we got a Fab Lab uh, approved as a mobile Fab Lab. Um, I, I think the maker movement is very strong in the Czech Republic. Um, and then the maker movement is very interesting. It has a lot of maker fairs, but it doesn't focus so much on education. I think what the Fab Lab movement uh, does and the focus on, edu and, on education more than the maker abilities and the community aspect then gives it a different pensum. Because we are an academic makerspace and because a lot of the funding from what I've been seeing for the last two years is focused on education and training, then it's not so much about the openness of the machines where the money is coming from. Um, from different actors. I haven't tapped into a lot of uh, like so many funding sources and perhaps it's just within my community. So I think that um, proposing for us a lifelong learning course similar to courses of Fab Labs uh, using the um, Fab Academy, using uh, Fabri Academy, all the different credited courses and saying we want to provide a version of that via lifelong learning courses, I think has granted us um, 
like a leg up from the other maker spaces or open workshops uh, within Prague. Um, so I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not sure that I'm answering properly your question, but I think that what um, you can use a little bit of the converse conversation from both if you require funding and uh, people are saying, how does it interact with the public? You say, here are a bunch of maker fairs, here's the access to uh, machines and workshops, and you alternate uh, the conversation and the wording. And if people are asking about um, education and training skills, then you say, yes, of course, progressively the maker movement is moving into accredited programs and vocational training and uh, uh, how you want to call it. Um, it was not difficult for me to get a Fab Lab approved, nor was it accessing the platform. Um, it is more difficult for me to relate to the existing maker movement in the Czech Republic because it is very maker-oriented and hobby-oriented. And my role is to turn it into how do we involve all these skills and this um diverse way of educating people and, and and formalize it in a way. I don't mean formalize it, turning it into a diploma. I mean, giving the opportunity to for people to uh, really access via small credits throughout life and lifelong learning programs, but still making sure that the academia then merges progressively into this mindset as well. And that means access to spaces, access to machines, um, I was an architect. I did a master's degree in the Mecca of places where there's machines everywhere in, in Stuttgart, going a little bit back to Fadia's uh, comment on that. But you can't access the machines of universities because they're project-based and they're fun funded by different projects. So then they buy it, they keep it, they store it. And that's it. And it's the fear of using that. And makers is the exact opposite mentality. But to what end do we want to keep motivating people to just make and make and make and not think of what, why are they making things or even educating themselves and others. So I think finding the balance between the the two is, is interesting and you can, um, yeah. I'm, I'm happy that we have such a strong maker movement, so I don't have to explain that and I don't have to be in charge of making maker fairs. Um, but I find that the that the educational aspect of uh, the the universal fab labs is is very um, is very good and it's um, extremely important so that so that you can explain the global connection aspect and and give some, um, access to people abroad to, to, a, to a larger uh, network and to larger opportunities via whatever type of training you can imagine. I, I see Yuri, you're nodding and I feel uh, also just because I didn't put this in the introduction, but Yuri has been organizing so many maker fairs since a very long time in, in Ukraine. And maybe you can also give us a background on on how's the maker movement in Ukraine and how's it developing so far? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Fadia. So <clears throat> it, it was challenging uh, starting from 2014 to understand or explain people this maker world. So <laughs> from from my part, it's still, it's still challenging. It's hard to translate it to, to Ukrainian. And uh, from my perspective, there's a lot of makers they, uh, that don't identify themselves as a maker. So we're trying to explain this uh, using uh, uh, preferably maker fairs because small meetups works well, but the coverage costs small. And then when we when we properly choose uh, choose uh, attendees or makers for the fair, then people who come, visitors who come, they identify themselves as a maker because we choosing not not exactly people and companies who sell something. We choose very different, strange and interesting, mind blowing projects, and this helps us to involve more people in in maker movement in identifying themselves. And then 
this is my pain point. And then when people came back home, they trying to Google and where can I go if I want to <laughs> to to make a prototype or to uh, to get some basic skill. Uh, and this is really pain point. So my uh, again my focus <laughs> is to help spaces not to open by myself a lot of spaces, but to help communities, people, initiative groups, and some volunteers to help them to build, not successful, but working maybe, uh, working makerspace, because it's it's a kind of, uh, it feel, feel, feels uh, hard, hard for me to call some makerspace as a successful, when I know what, what is behind this. So it's, so um uh, I, I'm using it's uh, it's exhausting and I'm using this uh, bigger event to promote maker movement and now we are in position when we need it on a country level on national level we need uh, people who have initiative who who are willing to fix from small to you know, big bigger uh bigger things and people who um, have basic skills and want to improve them. And it, it's kind of huge demand from uh, a lot of institutions, from Ministry of Education and Science, from uh, communities, from local authorities. Yeah, and uh, uh, what I'm interested about university particularly and particularly it's is uh, is uh, any practices best practices uh on uh, okay let's uh, step back so uh campuses is a thing things in itself it's a kind of part of university it could be closed for external people uh it, it's it's working for students and teachers uh preferably but there is some uh, some some practices I heard about Alto in Finland where uh, makerspace invites people not not only students and work not only for students but invites people from community who are living uh, living near or who are traveling or want to uh, to make small maybe small project or prototype or just work at the makerspace and they are. Uh, they are promoting that they are open for not only for students. So my also my question and maybe uh, maybe you know some best practices is uh, uh, university spaces uh, who work uh, with uh, local businesses with uh, uh, just local people or some travelers or uh, and what kind of uh, negotiation is it is it for example some open days or some time for uh, where people not from university could work there or it's only for events or what, what kind of involvement because what we need here we need more involvement for community to go to to the to you to the university and to feel to 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 make uh, to understand that university is a kind of knowledge sharing center for community also it's not a, not just for higher education uh to get the higher education higher education and higher salary and then these people go somewhere uh, uh, somewhere to earn the money this is the kind of uh, uh this is my um maybe my wish to build uh such a vision for new spaces that are opening at our universities. Um, and uh, why I am uh, thinking about this, uh, because we had not, not very successful implementation of makerspaces in four Ukrainian universities. They somehow, four universities somehow won Erasmus program. They visited Europe European makerspaces and fab labs, and they then they go back and buy uh, and bought and bought equipment and build a lab, and then they close the lab with the key, and no students was allowed to visit these labs. It was something 
really really crazy really painful and uh, what what we from association what we're trying to uh, uh, translate to community that the spaces it's better than to be open for students and it will be a huge advantage if they will be open for communities also it's not sounds like a question <laughs> but uh, uh, but again if you have some practices on involving a local community to the university spaces uh, uh, I will be very thankful if you could share this because this is what we're trying to to promote to at the national level and with uh, and with the colleges also. Uh, and uh, what I know from the deputy minister who in charge of colleges renovation, they have a huge grant from GIZ to this program of renovating professional technical colleges and uh, he told me that this is not a, even not a question uh, they will open these spaces for general public not only for students for, uh, for general publics uh, for k12 k12 uh, 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 kids and uh, and and, uh, and and just uh, for uh, temporary displaced persons for veterans they they go into open this wider so uh, i'm also interested how to make it work at the university uh, maker spaces and fab labs yeah Th thank you for link sharing i will study it thank you ricardo um yeah, I, I think it, it's um it's really interesting because um I guess I guess the four universities are are already established. I as as I put already in the chat, there's always like the third mission of universities and it's what what does it give to society? Um so firstly what I do with working with the universities is read the strategy plan and then we'll point out in every meeting certain vocabulary terms that they have pointed out in the strategy plan so that I can tailor to each one and that I'm sure that they sure that I understand what is what is their strategy. Um, I think that <clears throat> generally the, the university makerspaces rely heavily on the on the faculty or in the department or on the person who wants to give it out um, and uh, if they if they're already open and if they're all, if if you, like maybe just as as a quick question do are you resolving that you don't have a program or are they still in development and uh, are belonging to a single department? Judy, um, they uh, they uh, I know two three maybe three universities they are thinking about opening the makerspace. So the basic idea for uh, for now, it's kind of very practical for, for yesterday. They have uh, some um, small teams that work in at different faculties on different type of projects and they, they want to bring them to all, um, to, uh, to one venue. So this is kind of very, very practical. One venue with a proper equipment, with some space for lectures, for events, and like this. And uh, they don't have a kind of uh, pipeline for developing this space. And uh, they asking from time to time, asking us uh, if there any uh, any type of uh, best practices or playbooks they could uh, implement or could even read through and then think what they could get to the uh, to this new born spaces i think that the, the the playbooks are very like very interesting very important to have i think that we as creative people uh, that work in these spaces will just work via thousands of prototypes again so prototype on open day where you invite uh, people with disabilities see how the engagement goes get an appropriate partner that does so and 
you know, try out um, different scenarios with the available makerspace that you have. It sounds simple, but I have read several, I have read, I don't know, thousands of different playbooks of opening up makerspaces. Yes, you need a good ambassador. Yes, you need a good community mm -hmm. manager. Yes, you need this. Yes, you need the type of programs, but you have to very much make a in-depth research of what the um, specific makerspace uh, needs or, or, and, and wants, and then start with a like a, a successful pitch. What we started with was let's do a project for public space. So we work not with our own workshop, but with somebody else's workshop. Um, and we started it, uh, we just uh, started seeing and realized not a lot of, a lot of people say that they want to be involved in public space and public space projects, but not that a lot of participants would stay and come back to us. But when we launched a 3D printed course inside of the university and 3D printing skills, 150 students sign up to it. So some things are appealing to you, some things are appealing to the community. So you'll just see it with, you know, set up a, a menu of different activities that you have in mind already and try to launch them and see how the how the public uh, responds. If, if what you're looking for in, is a venue and a space and you already have the community on board, get a great insurance company to make you a very good price on the insurance of the space because people care about insurance, people care about uh, security and, and schedules and make sure that you say, you know, what are good indicators because the European Union only cares about KPIs. So great, say that you'll get 150 people. I don't know, just <laughs> like the most most important thing is get an insurance company on board on, on, on what you want to do in the space. Make sure that the person that you're going to inhabit the space is not the most fear-based person ever. Great. And then, you know, people are laughing, but this is true. Like I wanted to inhabit a space where people were scared of using a 3D printer and everything else. I just had to leave the space. I have no space for three years. Mike is still scratching his head because he knows it's true. But, you know, you just get out of that space and go to the space where it, it actually works. Like, don't go into the space that that is not going to... Yeah, th th that is not going to help you. I have had a conversation with a department head for two years and finally he's giving me a space. I draw up an agreement. This happens today. I draw up an agreement using chat GPT so I don't have to stress myself with 20 things. I say, hello, please make an agreement between two departments so they can share a space and we can host a lifelong learning course. It draws up an agreement. We have a conversation for one month. Five people don't want to talk about it. Then finally, the department head says, no, we have to do a proper agreement with the university and the bursar needs to be involved. And we have a call and he's like, well, actually, I just want to lend it to this department. It's just people are people, but just send out an agreement as fast as possible, make all the stuff. And then when people have it at hand and see these prototypes and proposals and drafts, people say yes or no. I don't know. I don't think there's a specific playbook. I just think people care about insurance access uh security these type of things and that's just get a good insurance company on board and yeah i'll let the others speak but yeah this is um uh, my my very few thoughts of how my 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 troubles have evolved here can i jump in um I, I, yes absolutely the um because we've been trying to do this kind of work in the library and, you know, it's a public space, but the library is um, responsible for uh, people's well-being. And the idea of putting those 3D printers in little cubbyhole type cages was um, the interior design company's way of sort of R limiting access to, I guess, the hot uh, melty part of a 3D printer. But that's how they envisioned it uh, in the planning for the building. Um, but the way it was actually used is that nobody bothers closing the doors on those little cubby holes that they've designed because you need the, 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 the printer to be open. And people get comfortable with this once they've had 
uh, you know, somebody guide them through the confidence levels. So um, as long as the manager and the people who are looking after the facility are uh, okay to um, work within, you know, sort of flexible bounds, uh, the environment that's created in that space, I feel, is highly conducive. So I think it effectively comes down to the people that are interpreting all of these KPIs. I mean, Singapore absolutely loves KPIs, um, but uh, I haven't to this date been able to um, use that to my advantage. Trying to find funding for this work uh, on the surface looks brilliant because we're talking about creating more uh, inclusive Singapore. We're trying to be... Um, uh, we're, we're trying to help persons with disabilities and include their caregivers. So technically it checks all the boxes and all the KPIs are there. And we're doing this on a um, every Sunday basis. So the numbers are very much in our favor, but there's no funding. So, so far we're very much uh, relying on volunteers to fund themselves, uh, which is working out beautifully. Um, because everybody decides how much they want to bring to the table and they don't overextend and they don't do what uh, a lot of us, I feel, wind up doing unintentionally is burning out. And this is a common uh, concern with the caregivers that come to us as well. They're often already burnt out or on their way to burn out because uh, they tend to overlook their own tendencies. Um, but what I wanted to quickly add in um, to what Leila was saying is, um, and to respond to what Yuri raised is, uh, we've tried um, the creation of the space. And um, yes, it's super expensive in Singapore, um, but these spaces that offer inclusive engagement um, are few and far between. So there's very few places where you can go on a regular basis to talk about disability or even try something out. In Singapore, there's just two places, and we are now one of those two places. Um, but what I found is it's not the space that really makes the difference. Um, it's the regularity in which we do it. And since we're relying on self-funding and we've limited our engagement time to weekends alone, uh, the fact that we do this every Sunday it brings people back in a constructive manner. And in Singapore, I don't know about elsewhere, but uh, whenever we do like a program for persons with disabilities and you get all of these sponsors that, you know, meet all the KPIs, it tends to be like a one-off where you have like a big show and lots of sponsors get lots of visibility and lots of people with disabilities and wheelchair people show up and it's a big duda and, you know, they get a, a lot out of it, but there's no follow-up. Um, one weekend, yes, a lot of projects are talked about, but then what after that? It's like what Yuri said. I mean, if you want to go, then uh, look for a place that can do some prototyping. If you have an idea, where do you go? Uh, so I find that um, the value of what we're trying to do with our little corner of the library is the fact that we're doing it every Sunday um, without uh, skipping. So even if they're not able to participate, um, yeah, the first time they come in, they just, you know, want to listen in. They can always decide to join in uh, the, the one Sunday down or two Sundays later. And the fact that there's going to be somebody else doing the same thing in that space every Sunday is really, I think, I feel like that's that's where our um, uh, value proposition really comes from. So I, I would strongly suggest try and create um, a, a temporal space that repeats itself rather than a physical space that is always there. A lot of input, and I think all of you, all of them is right, <laughs> and uh, not so much to add for me. Maybe one or two more things, for, especially for university. What uh, asked, what asked here as interest and help was that we had some professors who gave us, so they still had the tools. So they had a laser cutter, they had a 3D printer, and we just brought them to a, to the, to the space and opened it to the public and to everybody. So we had uh, strong support from the, from very specific people. So we had a core group who wanted, and we're also communicating that to the, um, leading leaders of the university. This was very helpful. 
And another thing um, is uh, what I could could add is uh, I missed. Um, sorry. <laughs> mm. The tools, temporary things. Um, if you we 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 are as a library open to everybody, so this is very very helpful. But still, you need to uh, facilitate the commun the, the communication between the people. So uh, this is what what Leila said, which every playbook is written. But you need the right people sitting in the space, see what one people do and what the other do, and then try to bring them together. Usually they don't do it by themselves, but it's very important that you would start to bring the people together, that there is this community thing uh, happening. Otherwise, it's just like they came, they use the tools, and then they run away. And if you want to keep it really good running, then you need to facilitate these group creation processes somehow. We do it, we try it in different way. After we are here now for seven years and we're still struggling with that. Some, uh, it's, uh, depends on the people. During the, the best thing is if you have a real demand, if you have somebody who wants to know something, want to do something, and then you take that and try to bring them together with other people who can help and want to help them. And then you start with that. That's uh, very helpful. We, we do it on... Um, since one year, we try to have a, every semester we have a specific topic so that we, uh, we, uh, we have uh, not one meetup a month. Let's say, like Sart uh, said, uh, every Sunday you have, a, you have another uh, a meeting, a meetup with a specific new topic. We, would, we do something like we have five meetups, but all related to, let's say, to VR, so that the people grow slowly from meeting to meeting with... Uh, Something and then hopefully there is also a, a group uh, of people um, created out of that which came back after this uh, campaign ends. So that it's not uh, that it, we have very often these one-time shots. So you sh you have an introduction to a school class. They came, they are happy, they go after half a day and they never come back. And uh, I think we think um, as far as I did, I, I saw even in France, I very seldom see. Uh, concepts which are created for you came, you're interested, and then you come back and you want to come back. And so it, there's a, a letter process what helps even uh, parents with the children or students. So when they, they come, they see, and then you need to somehow uh, organize it uh, that uh, they want to come back and then, yeah, want to come back and talk to each other. <laughs> But for, yeah, for one, uh, the concept is uh, you need the person, the right persons, and the other one, I don't have any uh, any good concepts. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but this is what I like to add. But all the other things, Leila and Saad said, uh, you're right. <laughs> Ricardo, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I think one element Another element that Saad's initiative in the public library brings to the table is the playfulness, you know, because you have the thing with the toys and creating toys and um, and then you can scale up in many, if you have children, you are, especially if you live in a place like Singapore that I don't live, I live in a completely different place, like a huge nowhere land, uh, but I I would say you search for places for your children, and then you find a place in the library because there are toys, and it's also interesting for you. You're not a place where you go with your children, and then you get bored, you know. So, uh, in a way, it's the same thing that Casa Criatura uses in Brazil, but in a more peculiar way to this unique to this space. Uh, there is parties. They organize parties, and and you know, and so it's playful at the same time. To have this playful element, it's a way to call the community further than just students or or interested in general. You know, uh, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> that, that's such a yeah, such an important topic and conversation around making spaces alive right and maybe sometimes you would think that maker spaces from the first sight are not the most inviting you know and i think all of us might have uh i think the more we 
get into it. We love it. We we want to be in it because we've been into that culture and we understand the depth of it. But I think also for 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 engaging newer groups and different groups that are not specifically uh, part of this ecosystem, we might need to think differently on how to make these spaces more alive uh, and engaging. Yuri, please. Thank you, Fadia. My question was maybe specifically to Salat and uh, and of course uh, to all community. So uh, let's uh, let's think that uh, Salat, for example, have to move from uh, Singapore. And uh, Salat, what is your uh, your actions now as a as a leader, as a community manager, to make this initiative work? If you, for example, will move somewhere or by by the other reason i'm interested in self-sustainable uh, communities because if we're thinking about these uh, university major spaces there is a kind of small salaries for people who in could be in charge or they have not a whole work day to be leaders or managers at these spaces and and i think it's it could be <clears throat> it could be uh, kind of huge challenge to make it work not only in evening hours, for example, or at these uh, uh, students' hours, but uh, but to use it w widely. And maybe you have some uh, some thoughts on this uh, type of community management for libraries. And and and, uh, and uh, question to Mike, uh, you mentioned that you spent more than seven years trying to build the community around. So could you please share your uh, your maybe ideas or some actionable things we could also translate to new university and library spaces? Thank you. Um, I'll just respond very quickly and then I hand it over to you, Mike. Um, uh, it's a very good question, Yuri. This is something I don't have an answer to, but uh, this is something that I've been trying to do um, within Singapore as well. Like I started off saying, we're the only one of two spaces where this kind of work or this kind of community exists, with the, even within the tiny little Singapore that we have. And space is always a challenge. It's super expensive to rent in Singapore. And any other makerspace, they just wind up trying to sell out in order to make the, the rent. Uh, and that dominates the activities. So you kind of lose track of helping the people that you want to help or educating the people you want to educate. So um, I struggle with this. I don't have an answer. And I've been trying to reach out to uh, other makerspaces. And um, what I can suggest and what I think will work, and this is what I'm going to try later this year, is to transfer not the space, but the practice. And this idea of creating a temporal thing, like something regular. Uh, and uh, in our case of the library, Sundays make sense because then you have families coming over, you've got kids and it's very inclusive. Uh, and the vol especially the volunteers, uh, they all have day jobs. And in Singapore, you have to sort of do this as a, as a side gig in order to make it work. Um, but I want, also wanted to show you, uh, inspired by Layla's uh, sharing about and Tolokar's uh, mobile maker spaces, I thought of, you know, uh, making a little Singapore version of it. So this is our little mobile maker space. It's the thing in the middle. So we just fill this up with uh, as many samples of 3D printed uh, little things as we can. And we take it along with us. Uh, I've taken it to other um, uh, maker spaces and libraries. Uh, it's usually filled with, you know, stuff like this, where we can talk about uh, prosthetics and uh, thermoforming and stuff like that. Um, so this is this is the space. Um, it's a, it's about building connections and conversations and relationships. It's not so much about uh, the machines and stuff. So we're just trying this out now. Um, I know it probably doesn't qualify as a mobile maker space, but uh, that's the best I can do with the with what I have. It is a mobile maker space. It's maker space <laughs> and it moves, you know. <laughs> Why, yeah. why overcomplicate concepts? 
And you can move all around your country with this, you know, you can move all around Singapore with your mobile makerspace. That was the intention. People said, you know, if, if I'm going to do this as a voluntary thing, I don't want to have to like spend on taxis. Can I take this on the train? And he's like, yeah, we'll get a, a small enough thing that will fit on the train. This is incredible. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to, yeah, sorry. I didn't see the hand there. But it's interesting to see how your environment uh, leads you to solutions which fit to that. We we have so many spaces in East Saxony that we're running with double decker buses <laughs> in mobile spaces. <laughs> um, Yuri, I'm not sure if I understood the question right, but um, I try to <laughs> still to answer. Um, the question about the community set up here is: uh, if you run in a university. You, we, we always have each three years or each five years that the students change. So they finish their classes and they, they, they disappear. And that's why, uh, so they need at, at the beginning two years to understand what a makerspace is. Then they need one year to find it <laughs> or, or in the other, other direction. Um, and then uh, they have two years where they use it. And in, within the two years, you need to create something like uh, that they talk to each other. And uh, yeah, this is usually too fast. So this is for the students, but you still have also the, uh, the, the, the teachers, the professors, uh, but they are in, let's say in Dresden, it's spread it over the city. We have 10 Fraunhofer institutions and they are always struggling with their work. They always, all 90% all, you know, of, of these are um, project funded based. So half of their work is applying for the next project. <laughs> and, uh, and in the other, they try to, to do something. We have one really good maker here is a guy from Ukraine. <laughs> he do concrete uh, with uh, carbon and he creates all his vacuum chamber and everything here with the machine just behind me, the, st the stereo cut thing. Really impressive thing. Um, but what we tried, okay, when we saw something like somebody like that, then we tried to grab that guy or the uh, girl and then we, cre we create them somehow, uh, no, we try to integrate them somehow in our um, classes in our workshop plans in our semester campaign that that, that we uh, take their own ledge squeeze them out spread it <laughs> and then hopefully they got interacting and and then they they they, they create a, a community around that whatever they want uh, but this is still a, a process we we we, yeah, we started it, it took it takes time so that, that's why there is now a group uh, moving around all over the campus, not only being here, using VR and AR. It just started last last summer. And other things, they always, now yeah, usually they only come when they have a, when they need the space. So they, they see it as a, as a at the, at, in the end, it's a toolbox. <laughs> you have the tools here and when you need the tools, you come. So, uh, and uh, to create something around that, uh, yeah, we miss the coffee and the, co the, so the sofa area. If we have that, uh, uh, if we have a, a, a glass cube where you have some palm trees, coffee, some music, I would say I would say that would be much more helpful <laughs> that people just came to to meet there, talk, have a coffee, and then uh, ah, hey, I know you, blah blah blah, blah uh, will happen. But since we do not have that, I mean. This might be one issue. We, yes, music, of course, music. <laughs> um, this might be helpful, but we do not have that. So we, that's why we're struggling maybe with, with that a bit. But we still try to, to do different things like what I, I meant, try to explain. Beertep, Tech Republic, every maker, I never saw a, a makerspace or lab without a, 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 a beer tap. This is very helpful, but in a library, ah. Uh, very difficult. <laughs> you could happy if you have a, a water tap. <laughs> yeah, that's everywhere the same. So that's why it, this is still the bridge you, bridge you have to get between uh, the food, coffee in the library. Just yesterday, I've been uh, no, yesterday, two days before, I've been to a public library in in Paris, one hour outside of the city center, and quite new building. And the first thing the community there wants to do is they want to run in with something to eat, with uh, coffees to meet there and read the books. And then the library guys had to tell them, no, it's not possible. And 
the architect didn't mention that when they designed the really nice building, but they for totally forgot the, the places to uh, have these activities. So this is ah. <laughs> um, I think if I can can um, go go in there, I think it's it's really it's really important to remain flexible. Um, I guess uh, I have the same issues as Saad, and that's why I decided for a mobile. Uh, Fab Lab, I will uh, share with you quickly. By the way, I couldn't raise my hand. Where is the little raise hand button? It's okay. Um, <clears throat> so in our yearly report, we said that we had done an ultra mini Fab Lab, which is we grabbed the backpack of a delivery person and made an ultra mini Fab Lab. Then we made a mini fab lab, which is similar to what Saad was uh, describing, which uh, can have any sort of machine on top, and then the drawers can be full of anything else. Our mini fab lab was not as pretty as uh, Saad's, absolutely, like, nor like well made, but it served us to lend it to a mathematics professor who is part of the board because he was ready to integrate uh, MATLAB in his 3D printed classes. So we were like, hey, host our mini fab lab inside of your office and, you know, have it access to students. Then we made our mobile fab lab also pushing towards circular economy and how can you recycle these type of spaces because that's what we are interested in. Perhaps not the university, perhaps not our main stakeholders, but for us it was Im important. I don't abide with the fact that we have to have beer and coffee anywhere because I drink neither of those two things. Saad and Mike knows that. So I would say, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, go for the trends. But I say, you know, sometimes it's really important maybe unpack something else that is not accessible at other types of spaces where people don't have, uh, you know, access to so for sure you can go with uh the trends th that is important but maybe give it a little bit of a twist and add something um that um yeah maybe maybe is you know missing in society or and and to see how you uh cultivate it uh so for us it has been very important to remain really really mobile and flexible i was only granted an attic to store some stuff in there, I couldn't even prototype because there's no electricity in it. But instead, I reached out to five different workshops around Prague and managed to do, you know, a bunch of different things. So what I'm showing you in our annual report is if we had to do a project on deep tech creativity with food printing, then we did a food printing workshop. And, you know, you have a photo, you have the know-how, you accumulate it, it becomes a workshop. If the only way that we had access within the faculty of architecture was with the first year students because they were the only ones interested. And instead of doing a all around workshop for um, the whole university and spending our resources in marketing and seeing that no, no students would show up, we just micro targeted the professors and said, can you lend us two to three hours of your class so we can teach your first year students how to 3D print? And then the uh, students uh, learned as well. And we did that a little bit, you know, to also for, fulfill our nowadays lifelong learning course, which is a, this kind of seven uh, block program in which we teach everyone a little bit about all the technologies. And, um, and then if a school wants us to go to a high school and teach them just about advanced 3D printing techniques, done, that block is done. So try and grab like those little resources. And as uh, Mike said, and Saad said, you have, if you have the machines, use the full space. If you don't have the full space, then break it down into little modules of machines that then you can extract via mobile fab labs. If they grant you, if, if you have more students and you need to disperse the machines all around school, great, put them in a delivery food backpack and, and make a project about delivery of machines made by high school students. Like, regardless of your problem, I think the access to technology is key. We're not talking about any other type of, you know, community activity. So have some technology, have some training to that technology and have a set of rules that you find 
uh, valuable. For me, it's extremely important that the education that we provide or the training that we provide is at the highest level and that it's always focused on sustainability. I'm not going to teach people how to do anything that they want, but I'm going to teach people that the technology is useful in a sort of way. So that's kind of like those core values are important to hone throughout and um and that the the access and the and um the fear of technology is not um then passed from people to people when i when i get a very expensive machine and that it provide and that it, it has a lot of uh problems um of access i will come to that and fortunately, because of meeting Saad and other people in Bhutan, now I like a lot the idea about assistive devices and assistive technology and carables. So you embed that within the education. And I let the community and the people come, come to that. Um, and fortunately, we have contacted all the different workshops around Prague and I see that the problem is in training and is in education and uh, they all have their distinct um, spaces and their distinct agendas, but we see that where we fit in and we bridge that gap into polytechnic education. We say, how do we get more people? We're supposed to be marketing the universities and be marketing polytechnic education, but in general, I'm just marketing the idea of maker spaces via a scientific method and how to get more people to become more rigorous and more interested in that. So um, <clears throat> us, we base ourselves in education so that when the point comes to then spreading our fleet around or spreading our resources and scaling like uh, Assad is doing, then we're able to do so because our educational package is available there. And um, yeah, I think it's think it's really valuable to um try to try to get just the basic uh machines that 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 uh you might need and with that that's already a, a great showroom or we set up a showroom a, a fab lab in 24 hours to show a school that we could do it in 24 hours and get um the contract for the high school to hire us um so i guess for us it's just been playing a little bit with that versatility and the ability to show just like a one prototype and people go, uh, you know, go for it, but materialize it. Maybe Yuri, go like use one space as your showroom space within Ukraine and don't spend so much resources, in my opinion, drawing a huge manual of something. People like to see the physicality and then you just tailor their solutions a little bit progressively. This is Thank been... you, Leila. Yes, sorry, you're. Um, so this has been incredible. It's uh, really like everything I hoped for and way more. <laughs> and it's just inspiring. I I just want to say something and and highlight. This was earlier said. Uh, there is this whole. Um, focus on or this word is used often in our community which is the maker movement and um, I wonder when yeah, sometimes what what makes a movement a movement right and whether it's a movement at all and um, it's really my understanding of what we're doing here right now and this kind of exchange is what kind of materializes it as well for me um, that kind of exchange I I would really love to assist in any way that is possible to see this exchange continue. Uh, I, I, I saw Eric dropped, but Eric was mentioning, um, you know, how could this also be materialized that you guys sharing that experience and learning into maybe a book, a handbook. This is something that I know is very hard to commit to if you're doing a million other things like all of us are. Uh, oh, Eric is here. So maybe also, Eric, uh, you might want to add on this uh, just soon enough. Uh, but maybe this could be a start. So this is my first point. My second point is I would also be interested to hear maybe. So 
today with everything that's being said, it is apparent to me that, for example, our input, if we were to talk to Omar Selfie from Egypt, who's been also establishing many maker spaces in universities in Egypt, and we've spoken about that, his struggles are completely different and uh, very interesting also to encounter and to see um, uh, their perspective and, and to see what it means to be dealing with a university that doesn't even understand the concept of a makerspace in the first place. So the, the whole conversation actually goes into uh, enlightening the, the, the faculty and, and the dean and the director into um, something that has already been built because it got funding in a way or, or another, and then became space that is totally unutilized because of the lack of understanding from higher faculties, for example, not even the students, but them not understanding what that space is there for. Um, so I was just wondering if like, if we can live up to this movement and have something that's documented, something like a manual, a catalog, something that could be used with uh, people that are having the same problem or same similar struggles everywhere in the world just wants to say that um yeah eric do you want to say anything uh before we end okay great and i echo everything you're saying it would be nice to have i love templates and manuals and and uh things like that's garden of different business models i think it's it's wonderful and then you get the trans the transfer but then the multiplication factors. So yeah, whatever resources are out there, how do we make it very abundantly clear what the benefits and uh, challenges are along the way? But thank you everybody for sharing. This has been enlightening. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, well, yeah, that has been amazing. Um, thank you so much really for being so uh, present, so generous with your sharing and bringing uh, your experience so honestly out there. Uh, thank you, Mike, Leila, for joining our community call. We're very happy to make that intersection and we would love to see how you could be more involved in this amazing group of people. I feel like, Leila, you already know some of the people. I'm not sure. Like, do you know Sad? Did you... Have you met me? Okay, great. <laughs> I cried. I cried too sad. I don't know. <laughs> and then we raised have... in a row about various aspects. And <laughs> if you need a therapist, I mean, sad. If you need a different <laughs> profession, become a therapist. I mean, this, this is fantastic. Sweet. Mike, fantastic. We don't drink beer together, but we uh, laugh and talk about everything together. I don't know. I don't know everybody else. I, I, I was enrolled in the Fab Lab uh, Challenge and Fab Lab community and Vulka because of being inside of the makerspace and European makerspace. So, but I love all communities, so I'm happy to join them, them all. Yeah. And Yudi, you and I will be in touch and you will be visiting Prague. And I can give you a personal guided tour of 10 different makerspaces. Uh, I offer that to everyone. Not me, not me, but uh, uh, people from from Ukraine because I'm not allowed to leave the country. So uh, it it will be, yeah. Thank you, Leila, and and thank thanks to all community for sharing such a, a huge inspirational uh, thing. So the most important uh, key points I get from uh, this conversation is first get get insurance, second be playful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Perfect, perfect ending, Yuri. Thank you so much, Yuri. Sad. Thank you, everyone, for being here, and uh, see you in the next call. Bye. Thank you all. Goodbye. All right. Bye bye. <laughs>